mushrooms. Magic mushrooms, fungi or fungi, you can call it both. What is the deal with this two and a half billion year organism that's recently been creating a pretty big hype? But actually, it's not just recently. Uh, thousands of years ago, the shamanic culture, they relied on mushrooms for at least what they thought were transcendental experiences, uh, which they called spiritual. And that's also true today. Uh, people tie the psychedelic experience from mushrooms to a spiritual run one. So today we're going to talk a little bit about that. Is that true? Is it a spiritual experience? Uh, but we're not going to talk just about that. Um, there's a lot more uh, about fungi, which is fascinating. Uh, the Mayans uh, basically worshipped mushrooms and they counted on them not just for spiritual purposes but also for warfare and strategy. Um, at some point, I guess it didn't work out too well for them since they no longer exist. Uh, today, mushrooms or fungi uh, are used for all kinds of things from cutting edge technologies like uh, absorbing oil spills and treating post trauma and helping cancer patients and a lot more but how is this uh, controversial you could say organism how is it related to us well in fact we descended evolutionary speaking from the fungi quite a few million years ago but these are our ancestors uh, so maybe as a species we can learn a little bit about where we're headed if we get a better understanding of where we came from. So let's jump right into it. Okay, hello, hello, I'm Gil Shear. This is Kabbalah Explained Simply. And today we are going to talk about the magic of mushrooms. So mushrooms is actually um, like the fruit of this l larger organism called fungi or fungi. Uh, and these, these mushrooms, this organism, it represents a lot of things. It represents rebirth and regeneration and rejuvenation. And this organism, it corrects life and it converts life. It carries life. It is truly a remarkable organism. It is a connecting force of all of nature and it's been around for billions of years actually and it flourished symbiotically with human beings since the very beginning now the reason why we're doing a session today about mushrooms or about fungi is because the understanding of this organism is an understanding of the entire system called nature uh, now, this organism, it, it's so powerful that, like I said in the beginning, people started worshipping mushrooms. They started worshipping fungi. You can see it in all ancient cultures. They felt that these um, spiritual experiences, at least that's what they thought they were, that they're bringing them some higher wisdom. And they started worshipping them. Now, the reason why this organism is so powerful is because of its connecting properties. Now, at the very core of this organism is what is called a mycelium. But instead of me telling you about it, I want to show you a clip from a documentary uh, called Fantastic Fungi. And actually, we're going to reference that documentary uh, quite a lot today. Uh, it's pretty incredible. I recommend you take a look if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, there's a link in the chat and we're going to see a few clips for educational purposes so let's start off with the first clip mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi so the mushroom is like the apple the bulk of the organism is growing underground and it's composed of these long threads and these threads grow one cell at a time, and then they branch and rebranch, growing in every direction they can, even three dimensionally. And that mass of threads is called a mycelium. The stick falls onto the ground, I pull it up, and there's mycelium. 
It is virtually everywhere. A mycelium has more networks than our brain has neural pathways and works in much the same way with electrolytes, electrical pulses. They're the most common species on Earth. They're everywhere. Just to give you an idea of how much fungi are in the forest, as you're walking through, it's about 300 miles of fungi under every footstep that you take, and that's all over the world. And they form these massive links. It's like a big web just growing through the forest. Mycelium that can grow out even just this big can have trillions, literally trillions, of end branchings. Almost everyone knows about the computer internet. The mycelium shares the same network design. Trees are communicating using the mycelium as pathways. They're connecting one tree to another. They're using the mycelium, too, to feed one another. In other words, one tree can swap nutrients with another tree using mycelium as the passageway. kin recognition as an animal behavior. Humans, you know, we love our babies. We know it's our baby and we're going to look after that baby. Well, we never thought that plants could do that, but we're finding in our research that plants can recognize their own kin. So these mother trees recognize their kin through their mycorrhizal networks. The mother tree and the baby seedlings are sending signals talking to each other. When they're connected together and carbon is moving between plants, the trees are supporting the weaker ones. If she knows that there's pests around and that she's under danger, she will increase her competitive environment towards her own babies so that they regenerate further away. It's a magical thing. And this could not happen without the fungi. OK. Um, when I saw this for the first time, I was just blown away. Um, the reason why, it's not only because of this incredible ability to be this connecting force of nature, to balance the system out, to transfer and pass on nutrients and, and bring, and bring all of carbon into uh, this equilibrium, taking it from from the air through the trees, which pass it on to the mycelium, which transfer it and balance it out in a intelligence, in a highly intelligent way. But that's not what really fascinated me. What I was really inspired by is getting a glimpse of the operating system of nature, how everything is interconnected. And we're finding more and more how that goes not just in single organisms or not just in separate groups of species, but between species. And we find that all of nature is basically behaving like a single organism. So just like our human body, it's built of all kinds of parts and trillions of cells and neurons and all kinds of molecules but they're all working in complete synergy to form this oneness, which is our body. Now, the more you look at nature, the more you see that all of nature is working in the same way. And the mycelium is so fascinating because that's probably the first um, multicellular organism. It is where we came from. We descended, we evolved from this fungi. So if we're talking about evolution, then I read actually two sources, 650 million years or 1.5 billion years. So either one of them, fungi uh, split, one continued to become life forms and the other continued to become fungi. So understanding how the most ancient 
natural system works can really give us an understanding of how we are made, what our root actually is. Now, if we look, you know, at all around us, then we can see these incredible patterns in nature of interconnectedness, of mutual support. But is that the case with human beings? Are, are we also acting as part of this whole that nature is? And I think the answer to that is clearly not. So why is that? Why are we humans seemingly the dominant species in nature, why are we not following that same paradigm as the rest of nature? I want to show you a quick clip from Kabbalist Dr. Michael Lattman, who even goes further down into this problem, into this issue. So let's take another quick break to watch another clip. To destroy ourselves, and eventually, if we look at the future, it looks really grim. We're the only creatures that can change ourselves for the better or for the worse. That can destroy the entire planet, or to the contrary, to develop and restore it. And therefore, we're approaching a state that the wisdom of Kabbalah calls the recognition of evil, where we acknowledge the evil of our own nature and that we must, that we really need to change ourselves. And the first stage is that we become concerned with how we treat each other. Because a person who wants to destroy others as if to his own benefit, thinking that by that he promises himself a better future, is gravely mistaken. We need to understand that there can be no better future unless we think about the future of man, about everyone's well-being. The future of the world depends on the future of man, and vice versa. And now we need to decide, do we want to destroy ourselves, or do we want to continue existing? Man will need to learn how to correctly use his powers of intellect and emotion. The wisdom of Kabbalah explains how can man use his forces correctly, and how can he reach the best and most optimal state. Okay, so what's going on here? Why is there the still, the vegetative, and the animals? And they're all working in this harmony. Even though, you know, a, a lion will devour its prey, it's still doing it as part of a, a harmonious, you could say, operating system. It's not doing it because it wants, it's thinking, you know, oh, I want to harm him. I want to better myself. It's just following its natural instincts to, to eat. And if a lion is eaten, then you most likely have nothing to worry about. You, if you're not a threat to that lion, you can probably walk past him and you will not be harmed. And unfortunately, that is not the case with human beings. Human beings are working according to a different operating system than everything around us. So, First of all, where does this gap come from? Why is there such a difference between the still, the vegetative, the animate, that they all work in this synergy, and human beings that are the dominant species, and yet they're the ones that are leading this planet to destruction? Why is that? Is it an accident? Is there a purpose to it? Well, of course there is, and actually, Things aren't all that bad because the darkest times are right before the sunrise. So I'm going to take a look if we have any questions for now. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, Renata is writing, no symbiosis with nature. I guess you're talking about humans. It does not seem that way. It doesn't look like where we are symbiotically connected to nature. Uh, like the rest of nature is. Um, I would like to know what a Kabbalist thinks of DMT after experiencing it. Maybe a topic for another talk. 
I'm assuming DMT is some form of um, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, if, if I'm mistaken, then please correct me. I can't say I've experienced it, but I can say what Kabbalists think of these experiences. Now, the psychedelia in this organism, in mushrooms, a lot of people describe it as a feeling of oneness, as identifying that all of nature is one, and they tie it to a spiritual experience. Uh, and in fact, let's separate those two things. Whatever people describe that they experience, you can't argue with that. And today, actually, medicine is finding that these psychedelic experiences can actually help cure PTSD. They can help uh, ease the depression among cancer patients who have terminal illnesses, and they have a much more, more optimal experience with the time they have left by getting treatments, etc. So there are definitely a lot of um, benefits in this world, but, and this is a big but, these experiences are in fact not spirituality. They are not spirituality. Why? Do Kabbalists explain that they are not spiritual? Um, we'll get to that a little bit further down into the session, uh, I promise. Okay, um, let's keep going. So it's clear that fungi, fungi pretty much represents the system of nature the system of interconnectedness. All of, all of natural life evolved from this organism and it, at its root, it's a system of interconnection. And it's also clear that we're operating human beings in the opposite way. So what can we learn from this organism? So in fact, human beings have the potential to be that same connecting force to be that spiritual mycelium for all of humanity, for everyone, and by that for the entire system. And it's not reached by uh, using mushrooms to have a psychedelic experience. Uh, it's reached by something completely different. So to understand where this connecting quality of fungi comes from, we need to understand the source of all of nature. So all of us, all human beings, we actually exist eternally. If, even if you look at the body, these molecules, uh, this matter, it will eventually die and be buried in the ground, it will decompose, it will be break down, and all of this energy will be simply transformed by, by fungi, by the way. It breaks matter down and it takes that back all of this energy, the nutrients back into the soil, uh, it nurtures the soil, and it creates room for a new life to emerge. So you could say, even materialistically speaking, this is eternal. It changes forms, true, but it's an energy, it's like the law of conserv conservation of energy. Energy is always, it always remains, it just changes forms. Right? But this is physical matter. Spiritual matter also exists in, eterni in eternity. And it has a potential that is incredible and is simply waiting for us to tap into it. So I want to show you another clip, uh, a little bit about the evolution of fungi, which will give us a better understanding of what this quality actually is. So let's take a look. We are all of the stars. My kingdom was born from the heavens four and a half billion years ago. We are the pioneers. We climbed out of the sea to create the fertile soil set the stage for all of life. In 
in South Africa, in the sediments of lava, they have found fungus-like organisms, mycelium fossils in the lava. 2.4 billion years old. This is the oldest record of a multicellular organism on Earth. This year, another fossil was found in the sediments of Brazil. It's 113 million years old. And it's a perfectly shaped mushroom. We divided from fungi about 650 million years ago. One branch led to fungi, the other branch led to animals. We chose the path of encirculating our nutrients in a cellular sac, a stomach. The mycelium remained underground, externally digesting its nutrients. Biodiversity surged. Until we had these great cataclysmic extinction events. And when the asteroids impacted the Earth, bam, enormous amounts of debris was jettisoned in the atmosphere. Sunlight was cut off. Plants die, animals die, and fungi inherited the Earth. From these extinction events, there's one lesson. Those organisms that paired with fungi survived. We are more closely related to fungi than we are to any other kingdom. What this means is that we are descendants of mycelium. Mycelium is the mother of us all. Okay, sound. So, we are in fact descendants of this structure of mycelium, uh, but I wouldn't look for some spirituality in mycelium, only look at it as an example of nature's core and how it behaves. And in fact, everything in this world, it comes from a spiritual root. And what is the spiritual root of this interconnected uh, nature that exists around us? Let's take a look. So we're over here. Okay. So uh, oops, hold on. My pen is backwards. Let me quickly fix that up. Okay. So I grabbed this. Um, this is actually uh, a network. It can be an internet network, it can be uh, mycelium, but it can also be, let's call it the spiritual mycelium. Right? Let's say this is the spiritual mycelium. It actually has a Kabbalistic name. The name of it is the soul of Adam Harishon. And <clears throat> what it is, it's a spiritual structure of interconnection. Just like the mycelium is in this world. So it's a structure that is in complete harmony and complete perfection and by being in that quality it is connected to the driving forces of reality now just like we saw in that clip when there was that cataclysmic event that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs because it made um, life unbearable unlivable on the planet you could say a similar event happened in the spiritual world before there was even time, before the Big Bang, before 14 billion years ago. And this was a shattering, a shattering of this con collective soul, you can call it that too. And the result of this shattering is a feeling of separation among all human beings, seven billion of us. Well, eight almost, who share a feeling of separation. 
sometimes we feel connected, but the truth is we feel ourselves as an individual that is disconnected from the entire system. And this shattering, it has a purpose. And its purpose is to bring us to truly be the dominant species on this planet. Not the way we are now, corrupting the planet, bringing destruction to it, but being the mycelium of the entire network. Not of passing on nutrients from one tree to the other, but of passing on spiritual energy to the entire system of reality, to every atom and every living plant and every human being and even beyond. And the reason why we're in this opposite form, actually, you know what? It's not even that we're in an opposite form because if, if you look at this body of ours, which evolved from that same organism, this body is is following the, those laws of interconnection. All our cells work together in harmony and we evolved from that connected structure and our physical body, this flesh and blood, this protein of ours, does follow that those same laws of interconnection as our, as our body does. Look at how the body works. However, what we have that still vegetative and animals don't have is we have another level within us. You can call it the mind. Uh, you can call it, uh, I don't want to say soul, but let's call it the mind, okay? That mind that, that I think, therefore, I am, that I'm aware of my existence. And this mind of ours, unlike the body, is working according to an opposite operating system. So this hardware, this body of ours, as all of nature, is hardwired for connection. It evolved from the ability to be a connecting force. And that's how our body evolved. But our mind, our intention, is, is not according to that same system. It's like the software that is operating according to an opposite program than everything else, than all of the rest of nature. Now... It works that way because humanity has to evolve to the highest possible level. And evolving to the highest possible level requires conscious participation from our side in order to achieve what is already built into nature. So while we're here, all of us, even right now, separate individuals and when we start even just wanting to connect just wanting just thinking about it even if you don't want it then wanting to want it that also works we start resembling we start being similar to the system up here to this spiritual mycelium the collective soul the soul of Adam HaRishon and by doing so, we begin to draw upon ourselves that same force of nature, that lifting, that connecting force. And that force, it dwells not in the broken parts, but it dwells in the connection between these broken parts. Okay, there's a lot more to say here, but I'll take a quick pause for questions because when the board is open, then I can't see any of the questions. So I'm going to take a quick look. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, I see a lot of you still asking about psychedelics. Um, we'll dedicate some time to that. But in the meantime, is Adam Harishon a part of Adam Kadmon? Uh, no, Adam Arishon is a collective soul in the world of Atilut. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, I'm, I see that there's a lot of questions here about the psychedelics part, so we'll get to that. We'll leave some time for that as well to talk just about that. Okay, so 
let's let's move forward to another clip. Um, okay, let's take a look. Evolution never stops. There's not one point that it happens and it doesn't happen again. It's continuously happening. The core concept of evolution is that through natural selection, the strongest and the fittest survive. But moreover, communities survive better than individuals. Communities rely upon cooperation. And I think that's the power of goodness. Evolution is based on the concept of mutual benefit and the extension of generosity. When we see it, we understand it. And when we understand it, we care about it. And when we care about it, we'll do something to help save it. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? individual. We are a vast network of molecules and energies and wavelengths. The interconnectedness of being is who we are. Yes, yeah, so that part is definitely correct. We need to go through a paradigm shift. And <clears throat> Just like that mycelium that we evolved from, excuse me. Just like that uh, mycelium that we evolved from, we have that connecting potential within us. And by practicing this connection, by wanting it, by aspiring for it, we're already beginning to bring ourselves into a system of balance. And in fact, even if it's a small group, a few hundreds even, that are making this effort to build that connection, then, like the mycelium, it begins to spread this spiritual energy through the entire network of humanity. And people will begin to have that feeling, that awakening, that there is something more. <clears throat> that there has to be something beyond this life of ego-driven desires. Let's take a look at some more questions. Um, okay. Um, I see uh, Seraphim is very kind of eager about, um, about what I said before about uh, Kabbalists who said that psychedelics are not a spiritual experience. I know it must be hard for, for many of you uh, who might have had such experiences and tagged them as spiritual to hear this, that in fact it's not a spiritual experience. It's a, it could be a very powerful experience. I'm not saying it could be intense. It could be, I don't know, the greatest experience you've ever had. Eye-opening, fascinating, whatever. But the reason why it's not spiritual because a spiritual experience is simply a result of this. Wait a minute. Wrong screen. Okay. A spiritual experience is building a kli. So what is a kli? Kli in Hebrew means a vessel. Kli. Now, a vessel, obviously, is something that can contain light, right? I have a vessel here, and this, kabuka, yeah. And this vessel, it's whole, and it can contain substance, right? Similarly, in order to be able to contain light, you need to have a vessel. Now, <clears throat> any experience that an individual does on their own, it cannot be spiritual because a spiritual experience is simply an interaction between a light and a vessel, the light and the clay. 
and what we are, we're shattered pieces of that clip. So it would be like me taking this cup, breaking it, taking a tiny piece of it, and trying to pour some substance, some fluid into that broken piece. Obviously that's impossible. And in spirituality, it is the same. It is impossible to contain light without a vessel. And a vessel is a result of reconstructing the only thing, in fact, in reality, that has been broken. So even though different experiences of psychedelia can be felt as spiritual, they're in fact psychological. That feeling of oneness that people describe, um, you know, even, even if you want to think of it logically, you know, you can think of all kinds of drugs that create all kinds of hallucinations and sensations, uh, some like this, some like that. So, because this drug creates that kind of experience, then people sometimes relate it to something spiritual. Uh, but in fact, the only spiritual experience can be a result of building a kli, a vessel. Uh, let's see what else. The hardest part to understand, sorry I can't pronounce your name because it's in Russian, but I'll read the question. The hardest part to understand is that the world is like an illusion. How? That is true, and it is one of the hardest things to understand, but I don't think I mentioned it, that the world is, is like an illusion. Uh, but since you brought it up, then the world is a spark of the spiritual potential that exists. It's a nothingness, a dot of the energy, the, the life that awaits. Why is it hard to understand? Because you cannot, oops, because you can not explain to someone about a sense that they don't have. Think about it. Try and imagine a sense that you're, you're lacking. What would that sense be like? You literally can't. You, you can't imagine a sense that you're missing. And that's why it's difficult to understand that this world is like an illusion. And Kabbalists write about this. Taste and see. That is the only way. No one can tell you or convince you. You don't have to believe anyone. You only have to be find guidance, find a teacher, maybe books, an environment that has this method, and then it is on you to apply it, to reveal it. Uh, Tai is asking, uh, does nature reflect man's intention? Uh, that's a complex question, Ty. It reflects man's intention, and in fact, we look at nature and we see it working in harmony, but we also see that there is seemingly this cruelness and you could even say brutality in nature, and in fact, Kabbalists say that when humans will connect, they will bring balance into the entire system that it will experience harmony in a way that it is not experienced today. And they write about this, that uh, a tiger, sorry, a, a wolf and a deer will be together, will sit together, something like that. Um, Renata is asking, is connection, communication, the right network? I'm not sure I understand your question, Renata. If you can maybe rephrase it. But if I, if I do get your question, then it's not connection as it is our desire for connection. <clears throat> because when we desire to connect, then 
that desire itself, just wanting it, not knowing how to do it, not even doing it, and possibly even not wanting to do it, but even wanting to want to do it. So any dire any advancement towards wanting to become like that system is already bringing upon yourselves a a remedy you could say sgula it's called in hebrew um <laughs> seraphim is still insisting Take a simple experiment, a minion on shrooms and a minion not on shrooms, who will get to Atilut sooner. No doubt that the minion not on shrooms, the reason is they will not um, be misled that they're already in spirituality. Uh, so therefore, they will definitely reach Atilut sooner. Um, those that think that they've already reached spirituality, then they will not strive to do the work. The spiritual work that is okay um, what about telepathy remote viewing and sensing that's a good question um, basically telepathy sensing all these kinds of kind of supernatural abilities are in fact not supernatural and we see that these abilities exist in nature as well animals have these sensations of natural disasters before they occur. They sense it. You see birds flying away before an earthquake. Um, they have these sensations which are natural, but they seem supernatural, you could say. And people can also develop such abilities which seem to be supernatural, but in fact, they're not supernatural. They're also simply natural and they're not spiritual either so just like the psychedelic experiences all also different abilities like telepathy remote viewing sensing like you wrote here at all things like that they all represent abilities that are within the ego and everything that is within the ego is not spiritual and it cannot be spiritual because spirituality is only rising above the ego uh, Excellent is asking, why not on your own? Uh, good question. It would be a lot easier, right, if we could do it on our own. If we could just close our eyes and become, read spirituality, go on top of a mountain, and me meditate and pray to the Creator. What do we need other people for? You know, they're just going to annoy us and disturb us from reaching our goal. And in fact, that feeling of what do I need other people for, it points exactly at the core of what needs to be corrected. And the reason why spirituality cannot be achieved on your own, and Kabbalah say that the minimum for building a Kli is two. Ideally it's ten, but two is the minimum and one is impossible. And why is that? Because this spiritual force, this spiritual energy, it does not exist in the broken pieces but only in their connection so when they connect and they begin sending these i don't know call it energy right we, where let's say um you and i are now connecting uh where's the question this is ah exilus let's say exilus you and i are now connecting in intention and i'm thinking of you and you're thinking of me and we're thinking about our source, that we came from this collective soul, from this spiritual mycelium, or however you want to call it, and in that state we were as one, not just you and me, but you and me and the entire system of nature, not just human beings, but all of the matter, everything that existed was connected as one. And with that mutual intention, within that, this emergent force arises. Not in me, and not in you, but in the in that network that connects us. Um, okay. Let's see what else we have here. I 
I see that there are still a lot of questions here about uh, DMT experiences and psychedelics, etc. Maybe we'll do a separate session just about that. Um, let's see what else we have. Okay, I see we're already... I would appreciate if you don't start using the chat to give advice to how to take drugs. So I would appreciate you not doing that. Uh, I would prefer you ask questions on the topic that we can all address. Uh, oh, Debbie wrote, yeah, that's a good comment, Debbie. Smash that like button. Yes, I agree, Debbie. Please do, if you're enjoying the session, go ahead and smash that like button right now. And if you find value in the content that we release here on Kabbalah Info YouTube channel, then subscribe, maybe even share the video and show it to other people. Uh, yes, so thank you for that, Debbie. Um, okay, there's a question here from Sandy. What about First Nations, communities that are connected to nature and use all kinds of medicine? Are they not in spirituality? Great question, Sandy. In fact, those communities and those people, they were connected to nature, no doubt about that. And you could even say to an extent that it was a spiritual connection. However, it was a spiritual connection on a, a low level. And why is it a low level? Because as we evolved, and in the past, um, you're right, we didn't have such a big ego, right? Our ego was a lot smaller. You know, if we lived in the caves and we just wanted food and a family and basic bodily needs, that's it, right? And then we were part of nature. But inside of us, there was something that was dormant and growing gradually from the beginning of time. And that is the collective desire. And that desire over the years has evolved and grown. And it evolved through desires from bodily desires like animals of food, sex, family, etc., which most animals have. It evolved to social desires like money, power, knowledge, and that is already beyond the animal kingdom. And it further evolved to even higher desires, which are a result of the end of the evolution of the egoistic desire, a state of reaching satiation. So those communities and those tribes they were no doubt connected to nature much more than we are today, and they were acting as a harmonious part of that system. But they were doing so as like an animal, you could say. No, not saying this in a bad way, but just like the animals automatically act harmoniously with the entire system, so did human beings in those times. But it also means that they were acting on the animal level. And the potential of humanity is to emerge to the human level, to the speaking level. And that's our real potential. And in that potential lies an emergent state that cannot be described and cannot even be imagined. But you can kind of guess how powerful and how incredible it is if you look at nature, because if you look even at fungi or, or ant colonies or all of these systems in nature, when they work together, then this intelligence emerges out of them, right? And they become like these super intelligent beings. And we humans, we're already super intelligent as individuals. I mean, in comparison to nature, I mean, you could say that, you know, we've developed communication skills and we are the dominant species. So imagine the outcome of all of humanity as it is today connecting with that huge ego and those desires that have evolved on top of that, above the ego, connecting to a single force. What would be the outcome of such connection? Okay. Um, Julie, since everyone in our existence is not practicing Kabbalah, then what's the way we can connect? 
good question, Julie. So in order to connect, you need a method, and Kabbalists have written thousands of pages, uh, many books about this method, but in a nutshell, it can be summed up to three things. A teacher, books, and a group. So a teacher is a guide. A teacher is a person that helps you advance on the path yourself. Books are represent an authentic source. So books can be actually even a video. Of course, authentic ballistic text has a lot of power in it. I'm not going to go into it now. Uh, there's a session on it called, um, I think, The Secret Language of the Bible. On a couple, I explain simply, so you can check that out if you'd like. Um, but the books is basically connecting to an authentic source, authentic text. There are 8,000 books on Kabbalah, on Kabbalah. They're not about Kabbalah. Most of them are written by just people who researched Kabbalah and wrote a book about it, not by true Kabbalists who attained what they wrote. And the third factor is a group, and that's probably the most important factor. And that factor uh, is most important because, in fact, the teacher and the books they guide connection. That's what they do. And the group is where you can apply this connection. So what is a group? A group is this. All of you who are here watching right now, you can apply this between each other. You can connect. No limitations on your connection. And even if you're watching this uh, a week, a month, a year, a decade from now, it doesn't matter. Because spirituality is above time and space. So if you connect to this energy, to this force, then you can do it at any time, any place. Um, of course, there are other platforms that uh, we connect students on, like Kabu, which was built specifically in order to bring, uh, to be that place where you can find all of those three things, a teacher, the authentic sources, and a group in order to evolve spiritually. Um, so I would just recommend to stay tuned to this channel, uh, click the like, click the subscribe button, and just, you can even keep connecting here in this environment, and if you want to check out our other options, then you can do that as well. Uh, let's see. Okay, there's a great question here from Poets Rear. If according to Kabbalah, some experience can be certified not to be spiritual, how does it define spiritual experience then? Are there any objective qualities to it? Absolutely, yes. Um, think of it like this. Spirituality, spiritual energy is in fact all around us. It's unlimited, it's boundless, it's infinite, and it's everywhere. Now, the only reason we sense this world and not the spiritual world is simply because we like a device, a tool, right? Like a radio transmitter. So right now, in the room, where you're sitting, um, are there radio waves? Likely, yes. Probably there are. And then, can you hear the songs that are playing on the radio now? Probably not if you don't have a radio on. So what do you do? You take the device, you tune it to the right radio station, you turn it on, and then you can pick up those waves. So it's the same in spirituality. There is infinite light all around us. The only reason why we don't experience it is because we lack that transmitter, that radio device. So we need to develop that device. First of all, we need to understand that it exists, acquire it, turn it on, and you'll pick up the waves. So with that example, is that objective? Yes, you can measure the frequencies, the waves that you're picking up, etc. In spirituality, it's the same. You measure the frequencies, and the frequencies of spirituality change. They're actually 125 degrees in spirituality. Um, Kabbalists have attained every single one of those degrees and written about it in detail in books that are like manuals for spirituality, like the study of the Ten Sefirot, which gives in detail all of the spiritual structure. And 
just like you can not pick up those radio waves if you're using a different device, you just want to pick them up, right? And then you can say, okay, but um, how do you know that you can't pick up the radio waves if you're using a cellular device? Maybe you should try it, but it's science. If, you, if, if it's not on the same type of frequency, then you're not going to be able to pick it up, right? There's, there's, no, there's no question about it. So in spirituality, it's the same. If you're not tapped into the right frequency, if you're not developing the vessel, that tool, then you simply won't be able to attain spirituality. And what is that vessel? It's connection. That's how it's built. It's built from our efforts to connect. Okay, um, let's see what else we got here. Okay, Sanctified Life is writing a uh, comment, feels like nonsense. Um, sorry, you feel that way. If you have an actual question, then I'd love to hear it and I'll try to answer it. Uh, what are we talking about here? We're talking about, you know, that, that I can answer, although it's pretty general. If you want to be more specific, then go ahead. But I can work with that. What are we even talking about here? We are talking about a system that is around us, a system of nature that works in complete harmony on all levels, the still, the vegetative and the animate, and only, only human beings, only us, operate according to a different system. And that system separates us from nature. It gives us a feeling of separateness, of alienation, of disconnect from the entire system we're in. And it's also bringing destruction upon this planet. This isn't Kabbalah, this is just science. Just look around you and listen to scientists. So we're talking about how we can upgrade our operating system. How we can become part of this connected network. And by doing so, being in balance with everything around us. <clears throat> the result of that... I don't want to say utopia because it's been, that term has been so violated by so many, but just imagine that wonderful nature working in perfect harmony and connection. Now just imagine that we humans also operated that way. What would be the outcome? That's what we're talking about. How we can begin to operate that way. Okay. All right, um, <clears throat> let's see what else we have. Wow, we're out of time. Okay. Whew, didn't even realize. So still see a lot of great questions coming up. So you know what, let's do this. Write down all of your questions in the chat, even as we end the session, even if you watch this tomorrow, the day after, uh, I'll be taking a look at all of the questions and I think we can maybe do another session uh, related to this topic and I'll base that session on your questions and build it uh, into a session that we'll do again in Kabbalah Explained Simply. So that's all we have time for now. We're gonna continue with our CubU students in our uh, Zoom session uh, where we can keep discussing this and ask questions, etc. So we'll see the CUBU students, the CUBU members. We'll see you guys on Zoom. And to everyone else, I uh, hope you enjoyed the session today. Uh, the magic of mushrooms. So I'm Gil Shear, and this is Kabbalah Explained Simply.